Hello everyone, welcome back to this video. Today we are going to be watching Kings and Generals, um, the Great Northern War Part 1. Uh, I'm from Denmark, and Denmark, for those who don't know, was involved in this war. It didn't really go all that well for us, but still, it is a very important war here in the north and involved many nations like it's the Swedish, of course, who were the enemy of Denmark, I, I suppose you can say. Um, Russia became a great power during this time. Denmark had a somewhat big influence in this war. Saxony and Poland and Lithuania also was involved and many other na nations. So very important war marks the end of the Swedish great power and the beginning of the Russian great power. So um, yeah, not just important for the northern, for northern Scandinavia, but also for the entire world, uh, entire world, I think. So um, yeah, we're going to be watching Kings and Generals uh, documentary series on this uh, war. If you, if you haven't already, please like, subscribe, and um, uh, go down in the comments below and tell me what you think of the video. Anyway, let's watch this. The Great Northern War marks the culmination of the tumultuous past couple of centuries in Northern Europe. This war not only changed the balance of power in the region, but on the continent as a whole. At the end of the conflict, one of Europe's newest and most militarized powers lay in ruins, and from its ashes, an empire previously on the fringe of European affairs would start its explosive rise. In this episode, we will talk about the events that led to the beginning of the Great Northern War, and cover the Battle of Nava, one of the most interesting engagements of the era. Speaking of interesting, the sponsor of So absolutely, absolutely, um, um the Yeah, Russia was this time a not a nothing country I will say, but it was very much on the other side of Europe, I suppose you can say, not really noticed by Europe. But after this war, um it became a great power. It really it really did, and other nations suddenly had to notes it in U European affairs and every time a major decision happened in Europe after this war Russia always had it, had to be considered in all this and Sweden who previously had been one of the great powers in the north completely uh, got destroyed and um, and uh, was no longer in a position to ever dictate your Euro uh, great European po great power politics in Europe again so, um, yeah, absolutely right. The Battle of Nava, one of the most interesting engagements. The ascension of Gustavus Adolphus to the throne of Sweden in 1611 is generally regarded as the starting point of the Swedish Empire. The able young king inherited a multitude of conflicts in the region, most notably the Ingrian War against the Tsardom of Russia. The war was concluded with the Peace of Stolbovo in 1618 which stipulated that Sweden would gain Ingria and parts of Karelia, thereby denying Russia access to the Baltic Sea. This was huge. Imagine Russia, a massive nation, losing access to the sea right here. That's a problem, because it cannot eject power into the Baltic region, it cannot in engage in trade with other nations in the Baltic regions, like it really was a big problem for them. So that's why they this becomes such a huge thing during the Great Northern War. And um by the way, if you're thinking, oh can they just trade here, those areas are frozen most of the time. So um yeah, they um, they need the access through the Baltic Sea. Russia, which was still recovering from the time of troubles, was unable to offer any significant resistance to Swedish expansion. The war with Poland-Lithuania, which had been sporadically raging on since 1600, was concluded in 1629. Gustavus Adolphus was not able to force Sigismund III of Poland to renounce his claims on the Swedish throne, but he was able to keep most of Livonia, including the important port city of Riga, and gain valuable trade concessions. In 1618, one of the most destructive conflicts in history, the Thirty Years' War, had started as well. 
although the last phases of the Swedish-Polish War are considered to be a part of the Thirty Years' War, the Kingdom of Sweden did not involve itself directly in the war before the King of Denmark, the former champion of Protestantism, had been defeated. Worried about there was the famous king Christian the Fourth of Denmark, um, and yeah, he absolutely just <laughs> it was disaster for Denmark that war, um, uh, because we were terribly led. The Battle of I think it was Lüder was just a disaster for us. And I think we later on joined the war on the Catholic sides, and again, kind of got destroyed there. But uh, yeah, the Swedish, they are being modernized during this period under Gustavus Adolphus. Their armies are being modernized, tactics are being improved. Uh, they are way better, way ahead when it comes to things like firing, mass volumes. And uh, this leads to them becoming, in the Swedish phase of the war, kind of the third phase of the war, when Sweden declares war against the Catholic part, the Catholic um, coalition, I suppose you can say. When that happens, they, of course, the famous battles of uh, Breidenfeld, Rhein, and Lützen, which is, of course, where he dies, Gustavus Adolphus. And even after the, his death, they continue to be Sweden continues to be a major power in all this. And yeah, they really get. Uh, they really become a they they are really becoming a a great power after the after the peace of Westphalia, which ends the war. At Catholic domination in the empire, Gustavus Adolphus, who was a leader of a Protestant nation himself, intervened on the Protestant side. Although the Catholics were close to a complete victory, the Swedish involvement changed the tides of the war. Sweden's superior army dominated the battlefield even after the death of Gustavus, and by 1648, the war was grinding down to a stalemate. Large parts of Europe, especially the Holy Roman Empire, were left decimated, demographically, economically, and militarily. In contrast, the Kingdom of Sweden, by acquiring territories in Pomerania and Bremen-Verden at the Peace of Westphalia in 1648, became the preeminent power in the Baltic region and one of Europe's leading states. Sweden may have been the dominant power in northern and eastern Europe. However, its supremacy in the Baltic was incomplete. Only several years after the Peace of Westphalia, they went to war against Poland in what became known as the Deluge. Even though the Swedes were dominating for most of the war, by the end, the coalition assembled against them proved to be too difficult to deal with, and peace was signed. The peace was a merely symbolic victory for Sweden, as the Polish monarchs finally abandoned their claim to the Swedish throne. Moreover, it also proved that the Kingdom of Sweden could not survive for too long against an organized coalition of enemies. Not only that, but 1660. Is it's right where the war comes to Denmark, and it's of course in 1661 that Denmark becomes a absolute monarchy. I'm pretty sure it was 1661, 1661, uh, that we have our we are one of the few nations who actually had a law that defined the absolute monarchy, the king law, kong law, we would say in Danish, um, and yeah. Basically, it means that, those who are not familiar with what absolute monarchy means, it means that the king has absolute authority over the nation, and it's basically above law, essentially. Uh, so essentially, it's kind of one, an absolute one-man dictatorship, I suppose you can say. And, um, and yeah, we, um, I think it's around this time where we also lose the last parts of Skåne, or Scania, I think that's how we would say it in English. Charles XI ascended to the throne of Sweden in 1660, and the majority of his rule was peaceful, barring the relatively short Scanian War of 1675-1679. There it goes, there it goes. During the war, Sweden conquered Scania from Denmark, but lost some of its lands in Germany, mostly due to the inefficiency of the army. And throughout the Great Northern War, Denmark, uh, tries repeatedly to take this area. Or, or I may only try one time, but still it's a major point 
it's one of, it's the main reason why they are joining the war to get this part back because we need to understand this had been a part of Denmark for many years before this and suddenly it's just conquered it's um yeah we we Danes, we Danes won in the back really badly After the war, Charles XI revitalized the economy and administration of Sweden. However, his most notable reforms were of a military nature. Those reforms aimed to make the Swedish army one of the best in Europe. They get what is known as Indelingsverket. I think that's how, I don't know how to say it in Swedish, Sweden, but in Swedish, but essentially a way to recruit soldiers en masse in Sweden. And that's how they get a professional army. And they continue to use this for a very long time in Sweden. Charles XI's death in 1697 left his only son, Charles XII, as the new Swedish king. As Charles XII was barely 15 at the time, Peter I of Russia and Christian V of Denmark saw this as an ideal opportunity to exploit Sweden's apparent weakness. On the 21st of April 1699, Russia and Denmark concluded a treaty of mutual assistance in future wars against Sweden. One of the secret articles of the treaty, however, stipulated that Russia would only join the war after it made peace with the Ottoman Empire. Shortly afterwards, Peter concluded a treaty with Augustus of Saxony, who was also the elected ruler of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. So the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, very quickly, um, I just want to scroll back and see the map. Um, some would call it a noble republic, a nobleman republic, a large portion of the population, larger than any other nations in Europe at the very least, are nobles. Only 9% I think are nobles. However, that doesn't mean they're rich. Many of them were poor, in fact. So they, they had a council, I think in them, in Danish we call it, they, I don't know what they called it in English. Please say, please anybody who knows what uh, the Polish government was called in English. Please tell me in the comments. But in Denmark, it was called Schneiman, I think. In Danish, we would call it Schneiman. Essentially, they elect a monarch. That's why Saxony, the elector of Saxony, becomes king of Poland because he gets voted on to it. And um, yeah, um, so you are beginning to see the alliances slowly being formed here. And absolutely correct. Peter the Great, one of the reasons why Peter the Great needed, uh, one of the reasons why Peter and Russia didn't join immediately was because they needed to stop the war in against the Ottoman Empire, which they were doing at the moment. They conquer uh, Azov right here. So yeah. Uh, yeah. Shortly afterwards, Peter concluded a treaty with Augustus of Saxony, who was also the elected ruler of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Augustus was a very proud and extravagant ruler, and his main goal was to return Livonia to the Commonwealth. Livonia, although a land that brought insurmountable wealth to the Swedish crown, was also a source of great concern. After Sweden had gained Livonia in 1629 through the Treaty of Altmark, it gave certain assurances to the old Livonian nobility that they would preserve the rights that they had had under the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, and that they would not lose any of the lands that were in their possession. For the first couple of decades, the relationship between the Swedish monarchs and the Livonian nobility was amicable. Charles X, however, was not as lenient as his predecessors, and by 1655 he intended to revoke a quarter of the lands that belonged to the Livonian nobility only with the Second Northern War preventing him from doing so. Charles XI would turn his father's plans into a reality after ascending to the throne, and by the time of his death in 1697, the Livonian nobility held only a fifth of the original number of estates. One of the nobles, Johann Reinhold Patkel, outraged by the Great Reduction, agitated the Livonian nobility to rise up against Sweden in rebellion. He was swiftly arrested and sentenced to death, and to avoid execution, Patkul fled from Sweden. So yeah, Patkul, Johan Patkul, I don't remember his middle name, but Johan Patkul is incredibly important in all of the alliances. He's very much kind of a guy in the background who kind of 
helps the various nations to form together. And um, the thing about Livonia, which he's absolutely correct about, it, it had a very strong noble culture, nobleman culture. Um, I, I think that's how you say it, aristocratic culture, perhaps you would say. Um, so what is happening around this time? With absolute monarchy, there's coming centralization, much centralization. There's a, there comes a monopoly on the military. Suddenly, it's no longer a feudal society where every lord can kind of control his own military sect or whatever raise arms against the king. No, now it's, uh, for example, in Denmark, the king is now the ultimate uh, man when it comes to war and that kind of stuff. Essentially a power monopoly or violence monopoly, I think you would say. Here in Denmark, we would call it Uh But a violence monopoly, suddenly he is the guy who is in charge with his government, of course. He is in charge of the army and he can lead it wherever in war. And um, through that, there also becomes a monopoly on taxes. Suddenly there is centralized taxes. Suddenly you no longer, the king no longer, ha he still has a lot of land, but suddenly he's no Suddenly, instead of like making money on the land he has, he can instead make money through taxes and use it to fund the army. But Sweden doesn't do that. Sweden does essentially the opposite. Instead of collecting money through indirect taxes, which they still do, but they primarily make money by expanding the king's land, essentially the land the king has. And I'm pretty sure that is why the nobles lose much of their land in Livonia, because they, the king, the monarchs, expand that the, the territory directly owned by them. That's why I'm pretty sure that's why they lose a lo large portion of the land, Livonia. So Sweden is actually not going the same direction as every other, many of the nations in the world are going. Sentenced to death, and to avoid execution, Patkul fled from Sweden. Patkul later played a key role in the formation of the anti-Swedish coalition as he was usually the diplomatic link between Peter, Augustus and Christian, and provided intelligence on the Swedish defences in the Baltic. Sensing the impending danger, Charles XII sent diplomats to Russia in the summer of 1699, with the goal of confirming a peace treaty between the two states from 1661. A skillful diplomat, Peter the Great assures the envoys of his peaceful intentions but in reality, he had already decided to go to war. Or you see that Frederick IV has now taken the throne. Christian V, who was his father, of course, um, he was actually, what do you call it? He was, um, uh, he died in a hunting accident. Back then, you didn't really shoot deers. Instead, you tied, kind of timed them out. And then you contact the, called the king when he needed to kill the deer uh, or the prey or whatever. And then he would go up and stab it with a knife. And um, essentially what happened was that the deer attacked him and um, gave him a wound. And uh, yeah, he would die from that wound. Um, but yeah, um, it's also around this time. I'll get to that later. You know what? I, sorry, I'm constantly pausing the video. I hope I'm not distracting. Augustus II also sent a diplomatic envoy to Sweden, assuring the king of his friendly intentions and asking for Swedish mediation in a dispute between himself and Prussia. While all of these dialogues took place, the coalition continued its preparations for war. Ultimately, the Duke of Holstein Gottorp became alarmed by the Danish naval buildup and informed his ally Charles XII of what had been transpiring. So. There's Gottrop, Holstein Gottrop, ruled by Frederick IV, as he says, um, is a main rival of Denmark. And not only that, but it's aligned with Sweden. I'm pretty, he's actually married. Uh, Frederick IV, is, of course, uh, Holstein Gottrop, is actually married to the sister of, of Charles XII. Um, not only that, but a couple of years prior, there was... Um, uh, there was the Danish king actually attempted to expand his territory and tried to a and incorporate Holstein and take away some of their privileges. It didn't work at the agreement at Altona, and that was back in uh, Christian V uh, when he was king back then. 
I should mention. So back when Christian V was monarch, he tried to take some of the lands and privileges away from Frederick IV, his predecessor, sorry, of um, Gautrop. And um, he expanded, so he was able to do that. But when he tried to do the same to Hamburg, uh, other nations went in and the agreement of Altona was signed. And that is actually very important because several nations, like uh, the elector of Hanover and uh, the monarch of Great Britain and uh, the Netherlands, who I'm pretty sure at this time, the glorious revolution has happened. So they have the same heads of state, Fred, uh, William III at this time. They are a guarantor of this agreement and the protection of Holstein Gottorp. So that is actually why they helped the Swedish at one point, and we'll get to that. Though both the Swedes and Holstein had tried to resolve the matter peacefully, the new King of Denmark, Frederick IV, refused to negotiate. The first act of war was committed by Frederick's troops in March of 1700, when the Danish army entered lands belonging to the Duke of Holstein, and shortly afterwards laid siege to Turning. Simultaneously, on the other side of the Baltic Sea, Saxon forces under Augustus entered Livonia and captured the port of Dunamunda. Charles XII, together with his war council, seeing the Danish threat as more immediate, decided to strike at them first. Great Britain and the Netherlands were uneasy at the prospect of a destructive war in the Baltic as they had trade interests in the region, fearing that the conflict might destabilize their economy. They have trade interests in, um, in the region, of course, and they don't want war because they will hurt the trade. Um, not only that, but again, they are guarantors of this agreement at Alta and Tona, uh, which essentially guarantees uh, the independence of Gottrop in a, in a way. So, um, yeah, they're not happy about this at all. The maritime powers deployed their fleets to Urisund to ensure that no lasting harm to trade and their merchants would be done. By and the weird fact is that um, they never actually declared war, I'm pretty sure. So even while the English and, and Dutch fleets are here, trade is still going on as long as they're pay it's paying the tariffs through the Urson Canal. They, they can continue to trade, even though they're kind of at war, but kind of not, in a way. So trade is still going through the area while all, while for England and the, the Netherlands, anyway, through this area, because it's very lucrative and they haven't declared war against Denmark, so. In August, a Swedish force of 16,000 had assembled in Scania. So attacking the main Danish army and lifting the siege of Turning seemed like the most secure way to deal a decisive defeat to Frederick IV. Charles opted for the riskier option of attacking the Danish mainland itself. The Swedish fleet, with Charles himself and his troops on board, managed to outmaneuver their more formidable Danish counterpart and make contact with the British and Dutch fleet. The maritime powers were willing to assist the Swedish king, so the Danish fleet was forced to retreat to Copenhagen. The fleet was led by Ulrik Gudenlöwe, Ulrik Christian Gudenlöwe, I think his name was. And um, I'm pretty sure that they never really engaged on the sea. I'm pretty sure he just immediately fled into Copenhagen to protect the capital. I'm, I don't think they actually fought. I know that they that most of the fleet went into Copenhagen for the most part. That I'm pretty sure they did. But um, I don't know if they engaged each other. I might, I might be wrong on that. Please correct me if I am. Skillfully avoiding parts of the island where coastal batteries were present, Swedish troops subsequently disembarked on Zealand. The Danish mustered up around 700 men and seven artillery pieces to attack the Swedish disembarking forces. However, they were no match for the 2,500 Swedish soldiers led by Charles himself. It was here that Charles XII saw battle for the first time and proved himself an excellent leader, being the first one to jump into the water and lead the assault. Charles XII is an insane man. That's all I can say. A very good army commander, actually. 
but very brave and very quite insane in one in some ways. The Danish were caught completely by surprise with this move and were starting to panic as the Swedish army was within a stone's throw of their capital. A few days after Charles set foot on Zealand, more Swedish soldiers landed there as well, and preparations were made for the march on Copenhagen. Meanwhile, the Swedish, Dutch and British fleets blockaded and started bombarding Copenhagen from the sea. With Copen None of these bombardments really did anything. Barely, I think no one in the city actually died, or and if they, if it were, if some died, it was very few. Very little damage happened. We surrendered very quickly. I think they were actually out of range for the most part. So they were actually most just blockading. And the bombardments were just fear attacks. I think, I, I, I'm pretty sure that was what happened. Copenhagen surrounded on both land and sea. Frederick IV of Denmark made peace with the Duke of Holstein Gottorp. And peace with Sweden was achieved soon afterwards as well. Uh... Not to be overly critical, but he was in he was visiting the army at the time where the peace was signed, uh being being uh, negotiated and signed. He was down with the army in Gotrop. So I don't think he he wasn't in the capital. On the eighteenth of August seventeen hundred, the same day that peace was made between Denmark and Sweden. Peter I of Russia declared war on Sweden and began his offensive into Ingria. The first target of Peter the Great's campaign was Narva, a crucial fort near the Baltic Sea. Peter besieged Narva with an army more than 30,000 strong and with more than 150 cannons. Such an artillery force would have reduced Narva to rubble, were it not for the fact that the Russians suffered from a lack of ammunition due to bad roads. With trouble brewing in the west, in what would become the War of the Spanish Succession, the fleet of the maritime powers transported the Swedish army back to the mainland before setting sail westwards. As the Swedish army, though Dinamunda, maritime powers transport, though Dinamunda, united, Charles was able to set sail for Livonia. Though Dinamunda fell to Saxon forces quickly and with little resistance, Patkul gravely misjudged the loyalty and intentions of the Livonian nobility. He had expected the Livonian nobility to join Augustus and Riga to fall quickly too. However, Livonian support was minimal, and Saxon forces alone were not strong enough to take the city. Learning of the man's name in charge of the of Riga, his name was Governor. Erik Dalberg, Berg. and he was a very intelligent man when it came to um, to siege warfare. So it was very bad that he was not on their side. And yeah, Patkul had ex had overwhelmingly expected them to join, but most of but the vast majority of Livonian nobility actually stayed on the Swedish side. So of the Danish defeat, Augustus II retreated across the Duna River in hope that Charles would agree to a ceasefire. Charles Augustus was a massive coward and a liar in many instances. He, he would change sides and change perspective based on whatever suited him at the moment. Very extravagant and kind of cowardly. So, um, yeah, it, it makes perfect sense that he now <laughs> flees and tries to make an agreement with Charles XII. ...arrived with a part of his army in Pernau in autumn. As Augustus retreated beyond the Duna River for winter quarters, Charles decided to head towards Narva and the Russian army. The rest of the Swedish War Council, along with foreign emissaries, tried to persuade Charles to postpone the attack on the Russian army until after the winter had passed and the army was united. Charles, however, wished nothing other than to meet his enemy in open battle, and not even the knowledge of the size of the Russian army could dissuade him. While marching towards Narva on the 7th of November, a part of the Swedish army clashed with a Russian raiding party under the command of Boris Sheremetev at Yuvi. Although the Russian raiding party suffered relatively heavy casualties compared to the Swedish ones, General Sheremetev became aware of how far the Swedish army was from Narva. On the 18th of November, Charles XII arrived with his army at the village of Lagena, 
about 8 kilometers away from Narva. Seeing that many of the horses were ill and that there was heavy snowfall, he knew he needed to act quickly. As soon as he was certain that Narva had not fallen and that his men were ready, Charles left Lagena. Meanwhile, the Russians, being aware that the Swedish army was on its way, began defensive preparations. Trenches were dug around the Narva River's meander, and wooden stakes were placed in the center on the Goldenhof Hill. There were two rows of ramparts running alongside the trench as well, and between them there were soldiers' barracks. Several artillery batteries were placed along the trenches, although they would not have any effect on the battle, as the Russian army ran out of ammunition several weeks before. Sources differ when it comes to the exact size of the Russian army, but modern estimates agree that they had between 35,000 and 40,000 men at their disposal, with the overwhelming majority being infantry. The Russian forces were stretched for over six kilometers on their side of the trenches. The Russian army was under the general command of Peter I and Field Marshal Fyodor Golovin. The right wing of the Russian forces were commanded by General Avtonom Golovin, the center by Ivan Trebotskoy, and the left by Adam Vierde. The Russian cavalry, placed on the far side of their left wing, near the bank of the Narva River, was commanded by Boris Jeremietev. The Swedes had around 9,000 men out of which 5,500 were grenadiers, 3,500 dragoon cavalry, and 37 cannons. The army was split into two relatively equal parts. The right wing contained 3,000 grenadiers, and was commanded by Otto Welling, a veteran of the Scanian War. It was divided into three columns, with the one in the center being smaller, and being hollow in the middle. The left wing was divided into two groups, with one being commanded by Field Marshal Karl Gustav Rienschuld and the other by Magnus Stjernbock. Rienschuld had around 1,500 infantry, divided into two columns, while Stjernbock had 1,000 infantrymen under his command. The Swedish cavalry was positioned on the flanks, mostly in order to guard the infantry against Russian flanking maneuvers. Charles XII himself led the cavalry on the left flank. The Swedish artillery corps under the command of Johan Hublad, had 16 artillery pieces placed in between the left and right wing of the army, and 21 were positioned on the left wing. <laughs> Moving his army so through the forest you know and barely that. passable trail. Uh, the Swedish are outnumbered. And not only that, but they are gonna attack a fortification, a defensive fortification, so they are in trouble. That's a... Normal, those don't know, usually you need a one to one third advantage when you're atta you attacking someone. At least a defensive formation like this. So, um, yeah. Charles reached the outskirts of Nava and positioned himself on Germansburg Hill. After performing reconnaissance of the Russian defenses, at 10 a.m. on the 19th, Charles positioned his army in preparation for battle. He was hoping to meet Peter on the battlefield. However, the Tsar had left Narva the day before the battle, taking Fyodor Golovin with him. The command of the army was passed to Charles Eugene de Croix, a Saxon diplomatic envoy to Peter. De Croix, aware of his lack of military skill, was initially unwilling to take command of the army. However, it is said that Peter convinced him over a glass of wine. Afternoon Golovin, Bieda, and Trebetskoy were just as inexperienced as de Croix was. The most capable Russian commander at Narva was Boris Sheremetev, although he was passed over for holding a lower rank than the others. The Russian commanders, even though fielding a superior force, were unwilling to commit to open battle fearing that the Swedish army that they were seeing was merely the so vanguard the of a much right. greater unit. There is uh, no clear leadership. The Tsar is gone and has taken his field marshal with him. Most of the others are bickering and have no real sense of military experience whatsoever. There's no clear initiative. There's no clear um, like plan whatsoever. They're not willing to commit to anything. They're just kind of 
standing there, I suppose, not really doing, it, not really trying, just trying to defend themselves, I suppose, not really, not really taking any initiative, which is really bad against um, a man like Charles XII who really likes to take initiative and really likes to go forward and try something new and attack. The battle commenced when Charles ordered his soldiers to fire two volleys at their enemies and advance towards the trenches. At 2pm, the weather changed. A heavy snowstorm and hailstorm started, and the wind was blowing directly in the face of the Russian soldiers. Using the snowstorm as a screen, Charles ordered his men to fill up the trenches with fascines and start directly assaulting the Russian positions. In less than 15 minutes, the Swedish really infantry filled up the trenches the enough for their the cavalry to pass. At the the like at Elau, for example, the Battle of Elau, where the French nearly lost because they couldn't, because of the snowstorm. And Pierre Osho marched directly into the enemy because he couldn't see them because of the snowstorm. So um, things like this can change a battle completely. It can change advantages to make advantages to, to dis disadvantages. Because suddenly you have a defensive formation, but you can't see the enemy, and it, the wind is blowing in your face. So that's so Charles is able to surprise them that way. I get close, and and again they are not there are no real plan or initiative. So they are just kind of they're surprised by it and don't know what to do. So yeah, he gets kind of lucky here, Charles the Twelfth, I would say, with the weather and the fact that the leaders are incompetent. The Russian soldiers did not see the Swedes until they were right in front of them. The infantry under the command of Rienschild quickly captured the artillery batteries in the center, while the infantry under Stienbock directly assaulted the Russian army. Due to the number of barracks and the bad positioning of the Russian ramparts, the Russian troops did not have much room to maneuver, and brutal close quarters combat ensued, where the Swedish soldiers had the clear upper hand. Due to the relentless Swedish assault and the surprise of the attack, the majority of the Russian right flank descended into complete disarray. A large number of the soldiers fled towards the bridge to the north. Few managed to escape though, as the bridge collapsed under their weight, taking many men with it to the bottom of the river. Many of the Russian soldiers tried swimming across the ice-cold river as well, with almost all drowning in the process. The soldiers who were left in the trenches also started to flee, only to be forced back by Charles's dragoons. The only part of the Russian right which still posed some organized resistance were the elite Priobreshensky and Simeonovsky guards. They created a wagon fort on the far side of the Russian right wing, near the Nava River. Continuous assaults against the wagon fort did not yield any results, and the Swedish army suffered heavy casualties. In the meantime, the Swedish right wing saw as much success as the left. The Russian forces were quickly routed, and part of the Swedish right was able to join the left wing shortly afterwards. Sheremetev, seeing that the cavalry would be useless in this type of close quarters combat, fled southwards. De Croix, also aware of how dire the situation was, decided to surrender to Charles. As night began to fall, the battle became even more fierce and bloody. Charles drew up many of his footmen in between the city and the entrenchments so that he could not be surprised from any side. Wishing to cut the lines of communication between what was left of the Russian army's wings, Charles ordered Hublot to capture the artillery battery on what Goldenhof disaster. Hill. Just what a by morning, they General Golovkin surrendered as well. One one. I'm pretty sure that the soldiers are spared and that uh, because they have fought bravely through the night and because the commanders in Charles' eyes, Charles, Charles' eyes have been very brave, I think they even keep their weapons. ...out to keep their arms, as Charles admires the bravery of the two elite guards. General Vieda, learning of the surrender of the right wing, subsequently surrendered the left wing. After receiving the arms and standards of the left wing, 
Charles allowed the rest of the Russian army to leave over the bridge, which his forces had already repaired. The battle was a catastrophe for the Russians, as their casualties amounted up to 10,000 men, with de Croix and most of the other commanders ending up as prisoners. The Swedish army, on the other hand, lost less than 1,500 men. To make matters worse for the Russians, the Swedes had captured 143 cannons and 28 mortars, almost the entire amount of artillery that Peter the Great had at his disposal, as well as the entire Russian baggage train. The Battle of Nava confirmed two things to Europe, that the Swedish army was one of the best and that the Russian army was as ineffective as it was large. Charles XII, merely 18 years of age, proved that he was a more than capable military commander, who, backed of by course, an army of as Peter great great quality as the Swedish one, could try. overcome the insurmountable the odds the that were stacked against and him. the navy, especially after he captures Nürnberg and it becomes St. Petersburg, and um, he would try to modernize the army, and he really will take the fight against the Swedish again, and um, learn from them, and eventually develop the army anew, and prepare for the war against Charles XII again. With the victory at Narva, a complete Swedish victory in the war seemed like a distinct possibility. On the other hand, knowing that his army was merely beginning to reform, Peter the Great was not disheartened, and he famously that remarked, like, they have beaten us, they, can beat us they, they might want, beat us again, us but in time to, they will teach us how them. to beat them. He will modernize the army and come back. Our series on the Great Northern War will continue soon, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see the next video in the series. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, well, that it helps was immensely. Very good. Our videos video. would be you impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube stuff. channel members, whose ranks you can join. Wars, showing the big scale, you know, the politics behind it, and then going in very specifically to the various individual battles and campaigns explaining who is command, how big the armies are, and all those kinds of things. Different factors. They're very good at presenting that. So, um, yeah, absolutely great. Uh, I cannot recommend them enough. But anyway, tomorrow we will probably be watching uh, the next video about the Battle of Klisov. So, um, yeah, hit that, hit that uh, subscribe button and like button and leave a comment. What did you think about the video? And did I get anything wrong or did he, Kings and Generals get anything wrong? I would love to know down in the comments below and give you and give your opinion about the video anyway thank you for watching i'll see you guys next time